Welcome back to Out and About. Now, in this part of the programme, we take you to the Senate House at the University of London, where Democracy Forum held a very special seminar titled, Is Pakistan the Victim of Terrorism or the Perpetrator? <laughs> Well, it's happening because of the current uh, dreadful situation of international terrorism, which we believe is being sponsored by several states, uh, Saudi Arabia, some of the Gulf states, Pakistan, are, we believe, training and financing Islamic fundamentalist and terrorist organizations and we think that the world needs to be made aware and needs to confront the actual issues uh, rather than pander to uh, the, the wealth of Saudi Arabia or the strategic positioning <laughs> of Pakistan. Thank you. So therefore like this is a, a seminar devoted to examining Pakistan's role in promoting terrorism while at the same time suffering the effects of it. This seminar is sponsored jointly by the Democracy Forum uh, in a process of continued collaboration with the Henry Jackson Society. Is Pakistan a victim or a perpetrator of terrorism? This is a current situation. I mean, a lot of books have been written about Pakistan. As one almost comes out of every, every month, uh, which shed light on aspects of the very difficult situation that they faced over the past 15 years. Um, and uh, different interpretations of it. It's very important to us in Europe, in Britain, where acts of terrorism have either been committed or um, anticipated. Uh, and it has had a uh, an effect on the Muslim and Pakistani communities in Europe, in Britain and in the United States, which uh, has not always been uh, something to welcome. Uh, Christine Fair, I'm William yeah. Crawley. I've just done a short introduction to this seminar. I know you're a very familiar guest and very nice to see you back. I'm sorry you're not here in person. There were people who were, were, ke so were keen to meet you as, to well, as well as to to hear from you. I want to really put the nail in the coffin on this canard that Zia al haq did this. Um, in my book, I, I go through all of the Pakistan military writings, really from the origins of the state. And it, despite the fact that Ayub Khan has the reputation of being a, a secularist, a womanizer, and a boozer, he actually began this. And I'm actually going to argue, and I have argued elsewhere, that the origins of this intolerance begins with the two-nation theory itself. The very ideology of Pakistan is utterly that certain people can't live together, and that's nonsense. And, and the second thing that Pakistan did that put it on this trajectory of intolerance was the objectives resolution. I think it's, uh, Pakistan is both a uh, victim, certainly. We've lost 60,000 dead. Uh, security forces and innocent civilians since 9-11. So obviously the victim, but certainly there are elements in the state that have used terrorism as <coughs> a tool to further uh, the agenda uh, in Afghanistan, in Kashmir. So yeah, so it's, I think the answer is both. I wish there was a map of Pakistan to show you that in the, why our military planners have used terrorism as a tool uh, over the past uh, several decades. If you <laughs> look at the middle of Pakistan, you'll see that Pakistan's main arteries, transport arteries, the rail system, the roads, pass very close to the Indian border. And uh, it's the Pakistan military's worst nightmare that India can cut this in a very quick armored thrust. So for many years, before 9-11 especially, uh, Pakistan had a doctrine of strategic defense 
uh, in which they thought that they could pull back into Afghanistan uh, and continue the fight from there. After 9-11, this changed. And now Pakistan relies more and more on battlefield nuclear weapons to neutralize the threat of an Indian attack across the border. Now, this has its own problems, which I'll come back to in a little while. But at the same time, um, there's been a growing nexus, as viewed from the Army headquarters, between Kabul and New Delhi. Just a couple of days ago, Prime Minister Modi has promised uh, an aid package for a billion dollars to Kabul. And now, obviously, Pakistan can't match this kind of money or buy this kind of influence. So what it's afraid of is uh, that there will be a formal alliance between Afghanistan and India, and Pakistan will be encircled. Now, many years ago, I asked a Pakistani general uh, how he could justify the use of uh, milit Islamic militants in Kashmir. And his reply was quite revealing. He said, you know, we send over a few hundred militants, and that ties down several army, Indian Army divisions. So it's a win-win situation for us. Except, of course, it wasn't. It was a lose-lose situation because, as Dr. Fair no, uh, mentioned, there's been massive blowback in Pakistan. I work on the Pakistan military and its interference in civilian affairs. And today I'm basically going to uh, try and assess Pakistan's uh, half-hearted attempts at counterterrorism and try to analyze uh, the fact that Pakistan's uh, military and other leaders have claimed that they are targeting good and bad terrorists because they make that distinction between good and bad terrorists and that they are tar targeting all terrorists uh, invariably. I don't think that's true. I think Pakistan's, Pakistan's military still continues to make those uh, differentiations. By good terrorists, they mean people who attack um, India and Afghanistan. By bad terrorists, they mean those who attack the Pakistan army. And I think that fundamental contradiction in Pakistan's counterterrorism policy uh, is, the, is the problem here. And let me disabuse anyone who thinks that the Pakistan army is fighting terrorism. Pakistan's army is fighting a few terrorist groups uh, with a few minor modification in tactics like Zarbeyaz. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, it became common knowledge, conventional wisdom, that the Pakistan army had really reoriented how it perceived its threats, uh, threat environment, and that internal security or the internal threat had become uh, primary. That's just hogwash, I think, because uh, if you look at the, some of the literature produced by the Pakistan army, um, which is openly available, um, there's really no acknowledgment that Pakistan is actually facing new threats. India is still the enemy number one. The existential threat that they counter from groups like the Tariq e Taliban Pakistan is perceived as India's proxies. Uh, India is supposed to be destabilizing Afghanistan through a mythical 46 or 56 uh, uh, consulates on the border with Afghanistan. Um, so basically, the idea is everything is being externalized, um, and the uh, and the and the perception is that. Pakistan's enemies are using its instabilities to implode it from within because Pakistan is a Muslim country with a bomb. Well, we, I start from the principle that the whole of Jammu and Kashmir is part of India. That means that uh, Pakistan should leave the illegally occupied part of Kashmir that they've been in since 1947 so that the whole of the state of Jammu and Kashmir can be reunited as part of India, as was already intended uh, by the Maharaja, um, so that we can get to a position whereby India can secure its borders and secure the, the position on a security basis within those borders, help and assist the whole of the uh, citizens of Jammu and Kashmir to live in peace and harmony, restore the security that's desperately required. We clearly have a problem that Pakistan is is responsible for state-sponsored terrorism coming across the line of control into Kashmir, into the Kashmir Valley, and beyond into other parts of India. Uh, this can no longer be tolerated. So we've got to speak out. We've got to be clear on this position and make sure that not only the position of the Indian government is maintained, but also the UK government makes clear that what is going on with the economic corridor, which is being put in between China and Pakistan and encircling India, the biggest democracy in the world, is completely and utterly unacceptable. The reality is that 
under United Nations resolutions, the official position of the Indian government and beyond, the stated position, and quite, quite clearly, is that the whole of Jammu and Kashmir is part of India and an integral part of India, and that's where we should be starting from. So the illegal occupation of any part of Kashmir by Pakistan should cease, and therefore the whole of the state retained within India, and then security can be maintained. The current position is, of course, that there is frequent, well-documented evidence of uh, infiltration across the line of control into uh, uh, Kashmir and, and beyond, which creates the undercurrent of, uh, uh, of both of terrorists. And this is quite, and when we talk about rational people, these are deliberately rational people. These are not hotheads. These are people that see a political and religious purpose towards cleansing, ethnically cleansing the Kashmir Valley of anyone who is not uh, a Muslim. There have been the frequent attacks, state-sponsored uh, attacks on India more broadly, both in the Punjab and beyond, and at each case, uh, it can be traced back to emanating from Pakistan. Our best wishes there to everybody at the Democracy Forum. What a very interesting seminar that most certainly was. That's all for this week, but as always, we'll be back at the same time, same place next week. So until then, have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.